Welcome. 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 I welcome you. Why wouldn't I? I'm not withholding. I'm not the kind of person that someone walks into a room. I don't welcome them. I'll welcome anyone who walks into any room. It's a burden. Sometimes I'm in a public place. Welcoming people. I have no business doing that. Oh, I got in such trouble at jury duty. Anytime anyone walked into the courtroom. Welcome. Please. Number 10, we've asked you to stop doing that. Well, I do apologize. But I believe in our criminal justice system. Gong, gong. And also, (laughs) I believe in welcoming everyone, even an accused arsonist, into a room. I tell you what, you want to make this easier? Have everybody in there first and then welcome the jury in. Actually, that's what happens. (laughs) That is how it's set up. That you walk in as the jury and then you're surprised. Oh, God, you guys are already here. Hello, accused arsonist. Jury duty. It's our civic duty, folks. It's a privilege, not a right. We get to do it. So everyone who's saying like, I have jury duty. uh -uh Uh-uh. I want you to change that. I get to have jury duty. Oh, I can't wait to go in there with a bunch of other people who are miserable De- deciding the fate of another human being. <laughs> hey, you know what? If you, want, if you want our system to really function properly, how about this? Free snacks. You should make that jury, that jury room, that deliberation room, it should be like a private club for 12 people. You should have nice, low lighting, cool music, plenty of snacks. I was almost going to say bottle service, but guess what? You don't want people drunk. But how about refreshing drinks? Get a soda stream in there. (laughs) But have a bailiff make the soda. Don't make the jurors make their own soda. Can you imagine our founding fathers walking into a jury deliberation club and seeing the jurors make their own soda? And if you're in the Midwest, pop is what I'm talking about. And then whatever region where they say soda pop, one or the other, come on, guys. Who's calling a water fountain a bubbler? What are you doing? Guys, get it together. We got to decide if we send this man to the gas chamber or not. Do they still have the gas chamber? I hope not. What? Hey, what barbaric forms of, <laughs> of execution do we still have? I know we're still electrocuting people. Great. Lethal injection. Oh, that seems very sophisticated. Hanging? Is anyone getting hanged anymore? Firing squad. I think you can request that one. (laughs) That's the way to go. Oh, that is the way to go. Blindfold. Cigarette. (laughs) Only one guy has a blank in his rifle, so he doesn't know. He can reassure himself he's not the person who ended a life. Hey, if we're thinking that much about it, let's not do it. (laughs) I like the idea that we're recognizing that it's traumatic to take a human life. But then we're like, all right, so we'll give everyone a little loophole. You could think that, oh, it probably wasn't me. I'm not a good shot anyway. (laughs) Fun. Welcome to Spontaneous Nation with Paul F. Tompkins. I am the second part. This is a show where I invite a special guest to have a free-form conversation with me inspired by a blind question from a previous episode's guest. Then I invite some improviser pals onto the show. And using details from the conversation with the special guest, we do a narrative improv that is one continuous story as opposed to unconnected scenes. And it is all scored on piano by Mr. Eben Schletter. <laughs> That's him. Now, I'm very excited. My guest today... We are lucky to have him. He's in town for less than 24 hours, I feel like. He is, I don't even know how many threats you can call this guy. Uh, singer, actor, uh, dancer, I'm, I'm assuming. There's no way he's not a dancer. That's triple. But he also, he's a director, he's a writer. He does everything. He's doing everything right now. 
He needs to stop so we can start the show. Ladies and gentlemen, please. <laughs> now he's doing some improv space work. He is miming building a shed. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show, Nathan Lee Graham. Yeah. Na- <laughs> now save your voice. <laughs> Nathan, thank you for being here. Thank you. You were telling me before we started, you woke up with zero voice. Zero voice. But now you have some voice. Yes, I landed at... Oh, oh no. <laughs> I landed at LAX to dander, <laughs> to cats in Whole Foods, cats on leashes in Whole Foods. <laughs> oh, to palm tree dander, to squirrels blowing in my face, to bokenvillea <laughs> coming in my nose. I don't sneeze. I don't sneeze. I live in New York City and I don't sneeze. When's the last time you sneezed? This morning. <laughs> so I've had steroids in my ass. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> this morning, a little amoxicillin from the CVS on 3rd and La Brea. <laughs> And I'm here with about a fifth of gin in front of me. No water. It's water. And I'm happy to be here. Nathan, I'm happy to have you here in in one piece. Nathan, I have a question for you. Please. Submitted by our previous guest. Are you curious as to the identity of our previous guest? I am indeed. Well, then I would direct you and the listener to the Spontaneous Nation archives on howl.fm. Hours of listening pleasure await you for a reasonable price. Get in. Here, here is my question. Not my question, but this other person's question. Mm. What bad job of yours would you erase from your personal timeline? What bad job of yours would you erase from your personal timeline? What bad job of mine would I erase from my personal timeline? Listen, I've been very fortunate. We're sitting at a wooden table, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I'm knocking on it. There's the proof. Um, to have not done anything outside of the business. Really? Never waited tables. No retail, no. nothing. No. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because the, the, the quantification was something that I would get rid of. Mm-hmm. I did do sample sales in New York, but I didn't fill out an application for that. My friends owned the company, and I just bought everything that they had. Right. So if you're doing a sample <laughs> sale for Armani or... I used to do Dolce and Bada before they pissed off the gays. Um, you know, Donna Karen, you, you just buy all of it back. Right. So I didn't fill out an application for that. They didn't have my social security number. I got paid under the table, but that was in the past. <laughs> and I wouldn't have given up that job. So there's really no job outside of the business. Is there that, anything in the business, though? No, that- no. <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> Now we're talking. Let me think, because I don't want to piss off some director. Um, oh, God. Okay. No, I can't do that either. <laughs> Jesus. I was going to say, mm-mm, can't do that. Uh, there must have been stuff when you were coming up that yeah. was like, this was a rough go. Oh, God. I've been really fortunate. What? I got to think of something, because we can't go on with the show if I don't answer the <laughs> fucking question. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, this is not a bad thing but I did Priscilla Queen of the Desert on Broadway mm-hmm. um, I played Misunderstanding mm-hmm. uh, she was the Tina Turner role I opened the show as on 12 minutes an, a 12 minute opener at the Palace Theater where Judy Garland performed um, and I was amazing what I didn't know <laughs> what I didn't know was that I'd have to be in the ensemble as mm-hmm. well And so I love my peeps. I love being in that show. It was an amazing experience. But being in that that show and doing the ensemble work was a piece of shit. I hated, I was a cupcake at once. At one point I was a cupcake. They sing, uh, MacArthur Park is melting in the dark. And I come out in a cupcake outfit with, with all of my other friends. Nathan Lee Graham is a cupcake. Now, it's fine if I'm doing the comeback, which I did, mm-hmm. um, and I'm a cupcake, but not on the pal- and not at the palace. So that was a shitty p- part of my job, and I'll never do that shit again, and I regret it. I regret it. So you did not know beforehand that you were going to be in a cupcake costume? No. <laughs> I didn't realize 
Priscilla, Queen of the Desert was a, was a, was it a jukebox musical? Yes. I did not know that. Yes, it was very successful. As uh, they all are. Right. And I did not miss one performance. I did 645 in a row. <gasps> I was not sick one day. I broke my foot during that. The bus, you know, the bus, the famous bus in mm -hmm. Priscilla, it rolled over my foot. <laughs> I was wearing seven inch platforms. Oh, listen, listen, <laughs> listen. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> what was that? Was the, was the cupcake costume hard to get yeah, into? Yeah, it was hard to get into. We had wonderful dressers. Let me tell you something. The crew is amazing. The people I did the cupcakes with are amazing. <laughs> but just personally, personally, it was not a high point. <laughs> <laughs> were you able to, were you able to mask your displeasure? Um, yes, because of the lighting. <laughs> because of the lighting on the stage it was all a dream sequence and so I actually lied to people and told them that I wasn't a cupcake but now everybody fucking knows because I just revealed it oh wait so when people would come to the show yeah I lied you would <laughs> oh yeah I lied I had 700 costumes right we won best costume we won a Tony for best costumes we won an Oscar for costumes mm -hmm. from the original film so we that's without lot, cupcakes yeah we had a lot of fucking costumes. But listen, <laughs> all anyone needs to know is I played Misunderstanding, which is a Tina Turner role. I sang What's Love Got to Do With It. I opened the show. It was amazing. They don't need to know about the 700 other fucking costumes I had to wear. So when your friends would come to the show, friends, family, whatever, mm -hmm. they only knew that you opened the show with right. this 12-minute amazing yeah. number. They had no idea that you kept coming back out in various costumes. Some were more revealing than others. I, pray, I played a pregnant teen <laughs> in one. Uh -huh. um, uh, but for the most part, I would lie. <laughs> would Until the very end, and I came out as a warrator, which is the national flower of Australia. But that was still the same character. I was misunderstanding at the beginning and the end. Sure. So it was misunderstanding playing a warrator. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and it was a fabulous costume, so I couldn't deny it. Would, would your friends say, hey, were you in... Right. And then you would say, no. <laughs> it's like when I'm not featuring people on the subway, you know, fe featuring, feeling. You get a whole glossary at the end. Um, but I'm, when I'm not, you know, hey, are you from Hitch or from this or from that or, you know, Zoolander? No, if I don't feel like it. Right. No, that's another black person. Even though I was the only black person in the movie. <laughs> no. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, that was another, and I do say, no, that was another black person. Do you get this? And then, of course, they feel yeah. horrible. And then I say, yes, it was me, and then we go above the whole spiel. Have you ever said that to another black person? Yes. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> they get us confused, too. <laughs> I just recently admitted that I was black, so... <laughs> well, congratulations. You know, I know it's a big deal. Because all of my black friends... <laughs> who are, you know, quite famous and in the business, they say, Nathan, you know, you do white movies. <laughs> you know, so for every five black movies or every 10 black movies, you could do one white movie and, and obliterate us. I said, I know. <laughs> do you, I know. What is, the, what is, what, break that down for me, how that, how that, the obliteration works. Well, okay, so take, I don't know. Barbershop, what is it, 15 now? <laughs> right. Or a Tyler Perry yeah, movie. Oh, oh, yeah, let's let's do her. I mean, let's do Tyler Perry. <laughs> so, Tyler Perry. Let's say you do five or six Tyler Perry films, and you're very well known in certain circles. On South Crenshaw, perhaps. Um, now, I come along and I'll do a Zoolander. Or a Zoolander 2. Mm -hmm. Or or Sweet Home Alabama. Mm -hmm. That'll take care of me for 20 years. Whereas you have to keep doing Tyler Perry movies and no one will know about them <laughs> or care about them. So that's what I mean by obliteration. So they're, they're, I get to sit in the front. Right. <laughs> as a black person. Because I do the crossover movies. The crossover movies that are going to be played forever. In perpetuity? In Is perpetuity? that a word? Throughout the, yes. universe, throughout the known universe. Wow, listen. 
<laughs> no monosyllabic system here. Um, <laughs> yes, on TBS, on TNT, I will forever get residuals every three months. Every three <laughs> months. <laughs> Something's coming in the mail. People ask me, am I working? I'm always working. Every three months I get something. <laughs> you don't get that with Tyler Bear. <laughs> you don't get that. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> now, maybe you do. I just want to see those checks, okay? Like Whitney said, God rest her soul. Show me the, show me the, show me the checks. Show me the receipts. Do you know what? I'm going to say that's a call to action for our listeners. If you are an actor who has been in multiple or at least one Tyler Perry film, please send us pictures of your residual checks. Please. At Spontanea Nation. I don't know if, I don't want to involve you in this, Nathan. You don't have to. It's a challenge. And listen, if I'm wrong, this is a good thing. Exactly. It's a win win exactly. for both of us. Exactly. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. So don't get upset and don't start preaching. And there's no, you know, Edmund Pettus Bridge and Selma. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. It's hard for me too. Can you imagine? I go up against all the white people constantly. Can I tell you that I once was replaced by Victor Garber? <laughs> what? In what production? Yes, because, because we're the same. <laughs> We're the same. I'm giving off the same essence. <laughs> That's what I'm telling you. I'm up against them. I'm up against Victor Garber. What are you up against? So don't, don't come crying for me, Argentina. None of that. When, when were you replaced by Victor Garber? In a failed sitcom, thank God. Um, let's see. It was called It's All Relative on ABC. I was hired on Monday and fired on Friday. I couldn't make that script work. I couldn't make it work. And apparently Victor Garber couldn't either. Well, apparently. <laughs> but I adore him. He's wonderful. He's, well, of course, we all remember Victor Garber from uh, Alias. Yes. I think most of our listeners would recall. He's a, an amazing uh, uh, triple threat as well. He so is a, from the Broadway a fantastic stage. Broadway stage yes. actor. Um, he was in the uh, the notable, it was kind of a flop, Assassins, the, yeah. uh, the Sondheim musical. Yes. Which is, by the way, an amazing show. It's, it's got crazy good songs. It's the about the score is <laughs> it's flawless. Yeah, it's it's about a presidential assassins and Victor Garber played John Wilkes Booth. I gave I was at a birthday party and I gave uh, the 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 guest of honor um, a copy of that soundtrack, and then another friend of ours said, "Oh, what is that?" And I explained the story, and they were like. Well, this sounds like the producers. Like this sounds like they yeah. wrote it to be a failure. I was like, no, it's actually, it's actually quite good. It's like, no, no, this sounds like it sounds like it was on purpose. Like it was supposed to be a failure. Like who would who would go see a musical about presidential assassins? Like, <laughs> it's, it's actually my voice is getting higher and higher. It's actually pretty good. <laughs> That's to convince. The, the higher the pitch is to convince people, <laughs> which always works, right? Yes, or the lower. <laughs> You've got to go to from one extreme. <laughs> Nathan, I I hate to say this, but we have to wrap this up. What a what a pleasure it was to have you. Are we here. already finished? We're already finished. This what is the hell? I know. <laughs> I know. I know. All I did was talk. I know. That's well, that was what you came here to do. All right, well here the piano's in. Let me let me ask you this, Nathan, because this will be releasing um far in the future. This will be July eleventh. So I'm gonna wish everyone a happy fourth. There we go. I hope they had a great time. And listen, I hope so too. And do I need to ask a question of someone else? I will ask you to write that down. Oh, yes. perfect. But perfect. is there anything you'd like to promote? Anything? Do you have any appearances coming up in the summer in, in New York or here? Um, I, I do have a couple, but they'll have to look at my website, Nathan Lee Graham. There we go. Dot com because they're changing all the time. But you know, I always work. I always work. Every three months, the check is in the mail. Yes. Nathan Lee Graham, thank you for being here. Thank you. We are going to take a break. During the break, I will ask Nathan to write down a question for our next week's guest and a location for our improv. And when we come back, you will meet our improvisers. All this and nothing else when Spontanea Nation returns. Loot Crate. Loot Crate. Hi, Frankie Valley here to tell you that this episode of Spontaneity Nation with Paul F. Tompkins is brought to you by Loot Crate. Loot Crate is a monthly subscription box service for epic geek and gamer items and pop culture gear. 
For less than $20 a month, you get four to eight items that include licensed gear, apparel, collectibles, unique one-of-a-kind items, and more. That's like I collect thimbles. I wish there was a loot crate for thimbles. Uh, get a new box of thimbles every month. Make sure to head to LootCrate.com slash PFT and enter code PFT to save $3 on any new subscription. Loot Crate is more than just a subscription service. It's an entire community of fans that share their experience and interact with each other around the unboxing of each month's crate. Oh, that's how I do on YouTube with my thimble friends from around the world. We all make videos of us opening up new thimbles. It's a, quite a community. Some are as far away as Canada. And Loot Crate guarantees $40 plus in value in every crate. Sometimes it's a lot more. Oh boy, oh boy, sounds nice. The most I ever spent on a thimble was $39. You got me beat, Loot Crate. Previous crates have included items from franchises like Star Wars, Marvel, The Walking Dead, The Legend of Zelda, and many more. Those all sound interesting. I wonder what they are. A lot of times, uh, thimbles will be themed around a, th a theme, too, like uh, the 50 States or the Ten Commandments or Isaac Asimov's Laws of Robotics. Join us as Zulu Crate celebrates the futuristic. They've packed Eli's crate with items from some of pop culture's favorite prognostications of science and the future. Look for, look, look for looking towards tomorrow with items from Rick and Morty. Futurama, Star Trek, Mega Man, <laughs> Valiant Comics, and Star Trek again, including a model, a figure, and don't forget a monthly tea and bit. Just so you know, in the copy, it says Star Trek twice. Remember, you only have until the 19th at 9 p.m. Pacific to subscribe and receive that month's crate. And when the cutoff happens, that's it. It's over. Hey, I know how that feels. It's like if you drop a, a thimble down the toilet. So go to lootcrate.com slash PFT and enter code PFT to save $3 on your new subscription today. Loot Crate. I'm not going to sing again. <laughs> Ads. I love them. Welcome back to Spontanea Nation. We didn't go anywhere and neither did you. It is time to meet our friends from the land of Make Pretends. <laughs> Sitting right next to me. <laughs> I like people act like it's the hand of death. <laughs> they don't know who I'm going to address. <laughs> well, you seem startled that you were the first. Yeah. This is our old friend, Maria Blasucci. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. Maria, you've been, it's been quite a year so far. It sure has been, yeah. Now, at the time of this recording, you were just back from the Tribeca Film Festival. Uh -huh. There was a film about you and your basketball team, yeah. Pistol Shrimps. Mm -hmm. Is that just the name of the movie? Yeah, it's Pistol Shrimps. Yeah. How was that experience? It was pretty cool. I mean, we we were approached by Morgan Spurlock mm -hmm. and his uh, his uh, friend Brent Hodge, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, they directed a, a, a documentary about us, and and uh, then they paid for a trip to New York. So fantastic! It was a lot of fun. What was the hesitation about his friend? <laughs> I didn't know how to say. I didn't know what to say because I couldn't say like his director. I had already said his. Right. And so I couldn't say his director. I see, I see. So I just said his friend, who is the director. But I also got the sense that they were good friends. <laughs> now, Mr. Sparlock was the producer. Uh -huh. Mr. Hodge was the director. Yeah. And this is a, a close working relationship. Oh, very close. Too you close. Oh, you think there's a little something going on? No, 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 no. Well, why do you make that face then? Oh, well, I didn't. I mean, I don't know. I was just asking. <laughs> <laughs> If they are, if they do have something going on, it's, you know, they better be careful because, you know, romance in the workplace is never a good thing. As ap this is why I'm asking, Maria. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to look at somebody else now. <laughs> All right. Good luck. This guy. I see him over there. He waved, but I saw him. This gentleman, you know him. And his name goes Matt Gorley. Hi. Matt, welcome back. <laughs> Hi. Wow, now, I lost we, my voice. What happened to you? I'm fine. I just think it was a weird hi. A momentary lapse of voice like yeah. Radiohead sang about. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Did they have a momentary lapse of something? Was that a song of theirs? I've never been a, a Radiohead head. Do you like the things individually, though? Radios and heads? Can't deny heads. Like, I wouldn't be here without one. True. And I love radio, sure. If you had to pick a favorite, heads, tails. <laughs> let me cut, let me take, take a look. Oh, I'm so sorry. Shit, let's it was move heads. On. All right. <laughs> I'm trying to think now. Was it tails for radio and heads for heads? 
I'm you, not sure you've what already happened. done more work on it than I. Yeah. It's hard, you know it's hard to do is improv just in your brain. Yeah. That's why I like spoonerisms. You can make yourself laugh. It's the only way to make yourself laugh. Because I've trained myself I'm sorry. to spoonerize. Who do you think you're talking to? Uh, my friend Cloudy the Ghost. <laughs> it's the only way you can make yourself yeah, laugh. I don't think you can say something faster than you can think it. I disagree. I, I absolutely know. disagree. Other than spoonerizing. But no, I don't I don't think that's the case. You I, I myself, Matt, I'm a living testament to this, that I will say things... And I feel like I'm hearing them at the same time that I'm saying them. Well, do you maybe know what I you mean? live on a satellite delay or something. I probably do. I probably that, that's do. That's a nice thing to be because I always feel like to say something, you have to at least a split second ahead of time process it in your brain. It, true. But when you say it out loud, you're hearing it for the first time. And it's so fast on the heels of the thought that it's almost simultaneous. You got to check your processing power, man. You, you're telling me I, yeah. I got to check my pro pal? You pro <laughs> dare you your intel pro pal i'm looking away from you I'm i've n- i've never this is a first in this show i've never looked away in anger <laughs> the, oh how did you get in my field of vision over there you know what my favorite spoonerism is what guppy woldberg Whoopi goldberg <laughs> guppy oh, guppy <laughs> bathy cates <laughs> okay guys so swillery hank okay. home tanks oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Seated directly across from me, <laughs> returning for the first time to Spontaneous Nation, we last heard from her live from South by Southwest. Woo! Can I do my own woos? <laughs> sure, of course. Oh, I thought that was for South by Southwest. I, I woo for myself and for places I've enjoyed. Matt feels like you can't woo for yourself. It's impossible. No, I can woo for myself because I don't think about it. There's the proof. The woo happens before the thought. <laughs> Let me get back to you on that. Oh, Tawny, one, hold, I haven't said her goddamn Sorry. name. Tawny Newsom. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. There we go. Thanks. Tawny, welcome back to you. Thank you. I'm glad to be back here. Thank you for returning to the show. Thank you. There's so many candles. So many candles. I like them. Because you've only done the show live. Yes. And so you didn't realize the amazing Venus flytrap setup that I have here. <laughs> no, I thought you always had an audience full of sweaty Texans. <laughs> and one drunk guy yelling. Oh, yeah. Whose wife makes him, him leave. <laughs> Did she? Yeah. <gasps> I heard that after the show. Oh. There was a guy yelling out. Was he yelling out suggestions? He was being generally <laughs> obnoxiously supportive. Yeah. Yes, he was. It was positive stuff, but it was too loud. Yep. And it was not welcome. And I think like a repeat too. Yeah. He thought he'd go for the callback. Yeah. A lot of that. A lot of that going on lately. You shut it down nice though. I liked your uh, I liked your firm but fair approach. Thank you. I I I was worried for a second that it bummed the audience out. Nah, they wanted him gone. I think they witnessed. I think when they got quiet is when they were witnessing the, his wife saying we have to get out of here <laughs> because of you. <sighs> You've ruined this for us. Can you imagine that's never happened to me where something was going on and my wife said we have to leave because <laughs> oh. you you can't handle being in public right now? <laughs> no. I mean, one time I was at a baseball game looking so visibly bored and I was too close to the field. Oh. So I think. <laughs> Were you on television? I mean, <laughs> could have been. <laughs> what happened? Did someone tell you, hey, hey? I think my aunt was like, We're a little close for you to look this sad. <laughs> and I was like, I'm sorry, I don't understand what's going on. It's you were so going, boring. She was worried you were going to distract these professional athletes. Yeah. yeah. She equated it to my being on stage. How would you feel? How would you feel? When somebody hits you with a how would you feel? And I'm like, people fall asleep during my show all the time. <laughs> I'm like, you paid for that seat. You can sleep in it. Have you ever seen someone fall asleep during a show? Oh, hundreds of times. It's amazing, yeah. isn't it? It's incredible. And then you try to do fun things with your voice and props to wake them up yeah. without the audience knowing that yeah. you're doing something weird. That's the best. I did a show with Amy Mann, previous guest. Check out her episode. It's a good one. And we were in Aspen, Colorado. And the theater was... Clearly, it was one of those subscription theaters where people just, they they had tickets so they would go to whatever it was. Mm -hmm. They weren't necessarily into what was happening that night. And it was the worst audience. It it was, you know how before a concert begins, the lights go down. What happens when the lights go down? You be quiet. You sit down. Applause. Applause. Oh, Mm. sorry. Lights. (laughs) Every. Were you at that show? Everything was correct. Everything was correct. (laughs) But the lights go down and no one clapped. And it was, it's a thing you don't think about until it's not there. And we were all backstage like, oh boy, this is weird. And so we go out and they were just like the deadest crowd. And then afterwards, Paul Bryan, who's a 
a terrific musician. Um, he's a bass player, and he said, at one point I looked down, and uh, there, was this, there was this couple, and they had their heads together. And I thought, oh, that's, that's really sweet. And then I looked closer, and I realized they were asleep. <laughs> so two people who were just like, yeah, let's together. go for it. <laughs> yeah, together. That's like the old couple on the <laughs> Titanic that decided to go down in the bed. Exactly. <laughs> oh, and those people died. Oh. Well, yeah, they went there to die. Died how they lived. <laughs> Asleep? Sleep, sleeping through a concert. <laughs> that probably is true, though. I'm sure if they, if they were subscription people for this theater, they probably slept through many a show. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Why even go out? <laughs> Maria, yeah. this is what I'm saying. Stay home and sleep. Yeah, or give your tickets away to someone that would like to go to the theater. But can I say this? Have you ever fallen asleep in public? Well, I don't think so. No, not, not just like... No, unless it's a class, a class maybe. Sure, but but even at like a movie or a live show or something. No. Oh, I fell asleep at the Royal Shakespeare Company once, front row. Oh no, man! Oh, Richard the Third came out at the um at the curtain call and just glared at us. We, we had just come off the plane. Well, he was sick of people glaring at him. <laughs> <laughs> How do you like it? <laughs> You don't look so great either. <laughs> he was the guy that uh, played the mean guy in Lord of the Rings, the second one that turns old, you know, that has worm tongue in his ear. You, oh, you know what I'm talking about? Brad Dourif? No, that that's his little henchman. In oh. That guy. That's the guy's name. Oh, I can't even picture him. I don't know. I mean, once I see Brad Dourif, that's all I can see. <laughs> I fell asleep at a play once as an adult and uh, it, it was a very strange production of American Buffalo mm. starring, who would you think would be in this? John Leguizamo, <laughs> Haley Joel Osment, and Cedric the Entertainer. Oh, that's right. I've heard you talk about this. Yeah. Before. And I, I had come from work and I was meeting my wife and my wife to be and a friend and uh, I was exhausted. And so the play begins and it's not good. And so I, I started to fall asleep and, and during the first act and I was like, I'm just going to let it happen. And then it was so good. It felt so good. And I woke up at intermission and then my wife and our friend made fun of me relentlessly. And then second act, my wife fell asleep. Uh, and I was like, yeah, uh, that's right. I fell asleep once on stage. What? what? That is insane to me. I know. I'm probably a little bit dead. What? <laughs> Oh my how, God. How? What were the circumstances? Um, we were doing a thing. This is at the Second City in Chicago. And we were doing a thing where we were writing the show where our director thought it'd be cool to have us stay on stage for scenes we weren't in. Oh, no. So, you know, it's a two-hour oh, show. Oh. And the second act, he was doing an experimental thing where we kind of populated the stage. It was very artsy. And I was so tired. We'd been there since... You know, we'd been there till 2 a.m. the night before. <laughs> we'd been there all day that day just working on dumb jokes. And in that night's performance, I was, like, curled up on the side. And I just remember waking up to laughter <laughs> oh, no. and feeling like I'd, I'd passed away. Oh. Did you, do, I mean, did you, like, you put your head down? Or was it, yeah. like, falling asleep in church where you're upright and you're kind of nodding off? I was kind of, like, sprawled. I was, like, laying on the side of the, the stage. So right. it, it looked like it was okay that my eyes were a little close <laughs> maybe <laughs> she's probably just squinting to see better oh it's terrible it was the worst feeling did people give you a hard time afterwards i don't know that really they knew i still th i think maybe if they listen to this they'll know for sure that that's what happened i think i, I hit it was was waking up to the sound of that laughter extremely jarring yes <laughs> it felt like having ice water dumped it, on it sounds horrible, <laughs> it was horrible. All right. guys let's go Let's take a break. We're going to take a break. We're going to regroup. Maybe we'll take naps. And then when we come back, we will reveal our location that we have procured from Nathan Lee Graham, and then we will do our improv. See you on the other side, my friends. Hi, friends. Paul F. Tompkins here. I wanted to let you know Spontaneous Nation Live is happening not only in Los Angeles, but also in a couple other places this summer. First, you can come to see us uh, Saturday. August 6th at Largo at the Coronet. That's going to be an amazing show with improvisers Tim Baltz, Dana Dute, and Tawny Newsom from Bajillion Dollar Properties. And our special guest is from You're the Worst, Desmond Borges. That is going to be a great show in our home base. Then we're going up to San Francisco the very next day, Sunday the 7th. Uh, and that's going to be with improvisers uh, Tony Newsom again, Craig Kakowski, and little Janet Varney uh, with a special guest to be announced. Also in August, 
Spontaneous Nation Live as part of the Detroit Improvisation Festival. Guys, this is very exciting. Thanks to Mark Evan Jackson for making that happen. Um, we're going to be at the Detroit Improv Festival Friday, August 12th. Tickets are on sale for all of these things now. Go to paulftompkins.com slash live. And if you don't, may God have mercy on your soul. <laughs> I love that ad. I love that ad. Give me that pill. You guys saw Limitless, right? Robert De Niro wants the smart pill. I want that pill. <laughs> Who's got the pill? Give me that pill. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to do our improv. We have procured our location from Nathan Lee Graham. And that location is... Oh! Before I reveal the location, let me tell you this. In order to aid us in our storytelling, we use sound effects <laughs> to move... You shut the fuck up, all of you. We move sound effects. Uh, honest to God, it is weird that I've been doing this for a year and I still sometimes forget to explain the sound effects first. <laughs> I don't know what happens. I don't know what's wrong with me. But guys, I, I need love. We're here for you. It's okay. You're Thank fine. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Pull it together. <laughs> <laughs> Pull it together. All See? right. Didn't make me laugh, though. Well, I that's, want that not, pill. that's not a guarantee. I want that belt. Just... <laughs> <laughs> In order to aid us in our storytelling, we use three sound effects to move us about in time. If we are going, if we're in a scene, we're going to go to another place that is happening. God, why? <laughs> Come on. Come on. Let's say we're in a scene and we want to find out what is happening concurrent to the scene that we are in. A meanwhile, if you will, you will hear this cut to sound effect. Whoosh. We're over there. Let's say, let's say... We are traveling backwards in time. We are someone is having a memory or we're learning how something came to be. We will hear this flashback sound effect. Think of uh, a harp. It's an old-fashioned instrument from the past. Get it? That means we're going backwards in time. If we want to return from a flashback to the present day or to travel into the mysterious future, you will hear this flash forward sound effect. Vibes. They begin with the letter V. That's later in the alphabet. In the alphabet's future. There's your mnemonic device. The future. All right. Now then, we know what that means. Oh, no. Who? I can't talk to you right now. Caller from Picayune, Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello, it's me, Robocall. <laughs> All right, we, now You're we come in with me. We can, <laughs> I'd buy that for a dollar. <laughs> we are now going to. <laughs> is Roy? Is you're coming with me, a Robocop? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One of his famous. I figured that's what you're doing. That's one of his famous catchphrases. <laughs> that's his only catchphrase. <laughs> Dead or alive, you're coming with me. I should have put that part in. Didn't at one point he say, "I'm Robocop." He never said that? I don't know. The top of my head is a robot. <laughs> I have a cop chin and a robot head. <laughs> here, here's a, here is our location provided by Nathan Lee Graham, and that location is... Paris. Oh. Pa <laughs> People reacted as if we were actually going to go to Paris. <laughs> My reaction was, oh, classic. <laughs> exactly. This one's going to be classic. Yeah. Oh, Paris. It's going to be high fashion. We take you now to Paris. I haven't missed a single performance, Donna, and I'm not intending to miss it tonight. Well, this is crazy. You're pregnant, and you have nine months. Tonight, you could very well have a baby. I could, or I could go for eight or nine more like an elephant. Listen, Cynthia... I'd love that you take your role of Juliet so, how do I say, uh, possessively. Yes. But as your nurse, in the show and off the show... <laughs> That's right, I have many ailments. I think that you should sit this one out and let your understudy take the part. What? Let her take it? She, she looks like she has feet for hands. Hey. Oh, I'm so sorry, Elizabeth. Elephants have feet for hands and you didn't have a problem with them. It's a fantastic point. Thank I'm you. sorry, I just, I'm not used to relinquishing control. 
I've done over 7,000 performances as Juliet. And I've never had one. I would just love to get up there one time, up in that balcony. And I think a lot of people are getting a little... Mm, well, they think it's odd Juliet's nine months pregnant on stage. She's a virgin. She's 13 years old, for Christ's sake. What? They have a problem with that, but not me killing myself for a dude? Uh, they that... think it's cool that a preteen is just throwing her life away for some D? No. <laughs> Nay, I say. At least pregnant, she's real. At least she's a feminist. Bonjour, bonjour, my backstage darlings. Oh. Hello, Francois. Is everybody Francois. ready for the performance tonight? Yes. Um, yes, Francois, feeling better than ever. No. Thank you all for being... What? What is the problem under I study? Guess. I'm just going to sit in the wings again and... What is your name again? Elizabeth? Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth. Yeah. You sure it's not Elizabeth? Well, do whatever you want. What does it matter? It never gets said. Your name, you mean? Well, like... You mean there is never the curtain announcement? No. Tonight, the role of Julia will be played by Elizabeth. Right. Maybe tonight's the night. <gasps> no, never. Donna. <laughs> Darling, how are you feeling? I feel fantastic. Are I you feel... still nine months pregnant? Yes, and I hope to be for the rest of my days. <laughs> <laughs> I've never felt more myself than when I have another self within me. Well, you look radiant. Thank you. You are beautiful, glowing from within, and of course, you look very pregnant. <laughs> Thank you. It's a bit of a distraction, don't you think? Oh. Excuse me? Well, it is. Elizabeth. Uh, you know what's a distraction? Elizabeth's webbed chin. <laughs> Cynthia, that's not nice. No, uh, Elizabeth's been through a lot. She took her, she spent all her money flying to Paris to be your understudy. You don't know what it's like to be able to swim with your head. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, is this a web chain? Uh, has it been all your life? Mom. What's the matter, Elizabeth? I was taking a bath and I didn't sink. Oh, I guess it's time we have to have the talk. What? You're a very special girl, Elizabeth. Oh, I know. Uh, oh. What do you mean you know? Well, I mean, all kids are raised with a sense of specialness, right? Oh, you're so precocious. Oh, Tap dance. <laughs> Look at you, you're a double threat. A tap dancer and a web chill. What? Uh, we have to talk. Elizabeth, one of the reasons you're so special is you have a chin that's unlike the other girls, and boys for that matter, or any human really. What is it like? You have a sort of fin for a chin. I like a rhyme, but I don't understand. Your face is fucked up. Oh, no, huge gust of wind. Ah. <laughs> what? <laughs> there she goes. I knew this day would happen. Fly, my daughter, fly. I'll miss you. Maybe think about going into the theater, or perhaps the circus would be better. Oh, it's a heartbreaking story. Yeah, careful you don't slip on a knife or anything before the show. Slip on a slip, knife? Slip on a knife? Yeah, no. You know, accidents happen. Why is the knife on the floor? Well, I didn't put it there right now. My you know, knife lives on the Davenport and nowhere else. <laughs> Hi, guys. Oh, look who is here. Oh. Hey, Briff. It's Briff, our oh. Romeo. Briff. You guys ready for tonight's performance or what? I am. I was born ready and my child will never be born. Briff, your crazy macho energy is, is off the charts tonight. I'm just pretty pumped. Whatever. <laughs> Uh, quick question. Uh, does anyone else have a problem with the way Cynthia looks? Uh, yeah. Briff, do you mean because she is an animal's pregnant? Yeah, I do. Uh, we have talked about this, and uh, Cynthia feel it is uh, her right as an artist to uh, uh, play the role uh, in whatever physical state she finds herself in. I'd like Elizabeth to play the role tonight. <gasps> well, this is not her of. Really? Briff. How dare you stab me in the back? Just because you're actually 14, you think you were born to play Romeo. <laughs> I was. And I am. And I will. Briff, do you mean to tell me you're exercising your leading man prerogative? Yes. As a leading man <gasps> in the Paris Theatre Company, this rules state that if the, he wants what he wants, he gets what he gets. <sighs> we are using Parisian rules, after all. I just, I feel like the rules could have been, you know, written in more of a, a, a classy, like a formal speech. Cynthia, I think this is a good thing for you. <sighs> How would you know? Because I'm your nurse, on and off the stage. 
<laughs> You're right. right. Doctor's orders and lead actor's orders. All right, fine, Elizabeth. But I want you to know, I didn't get pregnant normal ways by having a roll in the hay. I got it from this roll. It's a <laughs> curse that will live with me. What is it? When? Why? What are you saying? What are you talking about? When did you realize you were pregnant from playing Juliet? What light? Through yonder window. Wait, why am I doing Romeo's part? Yeah, I was asking the same thing. I feel a strange confusion within me. I, I'm, I'm sorry. Can we stop the dress rehearsal? Well, this is unprecedented. Uh, Briff, I, I feel a need to uh, to say all of the parts. Is that okay with you? No, that's not okay with me. That's bullshit. Uh, Celia, it's like you are acting for two. I think that I am. I think that some small part of me is male, while my outward... <gasps> It's almost like a tiny, small man is growing inside of me. Oh, fuck. This is very gross. This is sick. And, you know, I need a cheeseburger. I'll be back. <laughs> oh, that's all right. L- listen, uh, Francois, I can do both roles. I'm a mother now. I just learned that I'm uh, I'm going through a hormonal change, and now I can speak from both sides. Wait, wait, wait. So you feel you have suddenly become pregnant just from doing the play Romeo and Juliet? Yes, it's like uh, my menstruation has just evaporated into thin air. How, how did this happen? Um, I think, like... You you know, ju- are you saying it just happened just now? Yes, it was like an immaculate conception. On, on the boards. This is a crazy theater thing that I have never come across, but what do I know? I'm a very ineffectual director, and leading man goes off to get a cheeseburger. He seems to be in charge of casting. It's, I, let the, I let you... I mean, hey, why don't you play it pregnant? I, who cares? You're right. Really? Sure. Oh, I'll do this job for the rest of my life. I am a spineless weakling. <laughs> okay, everybody, time to start rehearsal. <laughs> Oh, I forgot you tell me this when it happened. Yes, you were there with me. <laughs> I forgot that I was there. It's hard to remember because it has been three years. I guess I got pregnancy brain just like you. We all, you know, it. it Wait, did you say it's been three years? Of being nine months pregnant, yes. We have been doing the same production of Romeo and Julia for three years? In English, in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> it's confusing. And, and so when Briff started, he was 11 years old? Yes, it was groundbreaking. <laughs> I was 20 when I started. I'm Ben Volio. <laughs> oh, look who is here. It's Timothy. Uh, oh, hello. Uh, hi. Timothy, you seem to have aged more than uh, three years. <laughs> I'm a Benjamin Button. <laughs> so you're going by the other way. Well, I can change it. Wait a minute. So, hold on. I'm a Button Benjamin. Benjamin Button went... <laughs> He was he was a, born an old guy. I mean, but then I'm he become Jack. young. I'm Jack. Jack, the yeah. Robin Williams film. Yeah, oh, yes. sure. Well, they showed the different movies in Paris. They show them differently. <laughs> They're d- subtitled. They swap the titles and the reverse aging. I gotta run. I gotta go. <laughs> oh, there he goes, Timothy. Always in such a rush for such a wizened elderly man. <laughs> well, I guess that's settled. I go on tonight. All Elizabeth, right. are you ready for this? Sure, I'm ready. I've Look, got the lines good. Want to practice? Yeah. In my dressing room? Oh, oh well. Wait a minute. Hey, Cynthia, come with me. Okay. Okay, Briff. Uh, I am, I guess, a little nervous. Don't be nervous. Don't be a bitch. <laughs> Briff. <laughs> There's something about your candor that is refreshing. Don't be such a little bitch. Come oh, on. God. <laughs> Briff. Briff. Uh, Come on. You're acting like a little bitch. Briff. Let me put my hand on your knee. Briff. <laughs> Briff, a, a knee is an important place for a young woman. Come on. Don't you want this roll? I suppose I do. All right. Then don't be a little... A bitch? <laughs> don't... No, I would never say that about you. Thanks. All right, let's do this scene, and remember, whatever I do, it's acting. Okay. What light from yonder window breaks? It is the east, and Julia is the sun. Gallop a face, you piry steed. You, you... Oh, Briff. Oh, Briff. Oh, Briff. <laughs> Celia, please stop crying, please. Oh, 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 oh. God. Please. You have been playing this same role for so long. My reputation. No, no one will. Every actor at some point has to let the understudy take over. No, no, they don't. No, uh, you know, Ethel Merman never did. Yes, I did. What? The ghost of Ethel Merman is here. Hello. Miss Merman, Miss Merman. 
How's it going? A big fan. Um, Huge. Uh, what, what are you? Why is your ghost haunting this theater in Paris? Cause everything's coming up. <laughs> oh my goodness. You know, I was I was hoping you could offer some consoling words to uh, Cynthia about uh, being replaced by an understudy, but you're saying you never have been. I was never replaced. I'm a ghost now, but I've never missed a performance, not once. Exactly. If that's you're what I a want. real actress, you won't either. Now, Thank you. let me get back to my stage song and dance. They'll never stop me. <laughs> Thank you, Ethel. Thank you. Do you see, Francois? <sighs> I... I feel as if I have been shamed by a ghost. Uh, Miss Ethel Murma say that uh, if you really are a real actress, you will fight for the role. Yes, and I'll play a pregnant preteen, and I'll somehow make it a political statement. Oh, you're finally going to add that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've been shying away from it. You've been pregnant for three years? But now I'm ready to talk about it. France is such a, you know, a free place. It is. I mean, people, uh, they do what they like. They have a mistress. They have two mistress. Uh, Nothing is shameful. They smoke in a church or whatever. Yes, yeah, smoking in church. That's my next stop after being a pregnant teen. <laughs> once You mean once you... Do you think you will ever have the baby or do you will be pregnant forever? I hope not. I'm so much more castable. <laughs> Well, you got to figure out how you're going to do this because, uh, as we have established, I'm a very ineffectual director, so I cannot help you in this. It's come down to you, Briff, and Elizabeth. I wonder how they are getting along in their dressing room. Me too. Briff, I'm pregnant. Oh, no. Not again. Uh, how did you do that? Well... And what do you mean, not again? Well, it seems that anyone that plays Juliet... Is- opposite of me because I'm 14 and I got horn balls <laughs> that I go after them and then they're pregnant for like three years. Oh no. But I can't. I, I've got a show Oh tonight. no. Your knock, belly knock. is growing. Zutalo, stage manager. Is everyone ready to get on stage? Elizabeth, you have a wardrobe fitting. Allos. Follow me. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you, Zutalo. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, Brief, it is me, Francois. Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, you are alone in the dressing room. Elizabeth has gone to her fitting. Uh, uh, uh. Get in the closet. Uh, okay. Get in the closet. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Get in the closet. Okay, I was going to. Because you didn't follow the stage manager. No, I know. I'll hide. I'll do anything. I know. You Get say, in Brief. the closet. Okay, I'm in. I, so I, did, I know you didn't follow the stage manager now. I did not. N- Okay. I'm here in the closet. There's no one here. Okay, because I sent the Lord to, uh, <laughs> to tell Elizabeth about the fitting. But the, she... the stage manager was here and she tried. Forget it. Let's go. All right. So brief. Listen. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't want to prepare you because uh, Cynthia, she is going to fight for this role. Mm-hmm. You know, she's not going to go down easy, even though she is... Well, that's the first time I heard she's not going to go down easy. Oh, brief, please. Oh, this is, uh, you know, this is uh, American talk. What? We, she's it... a little bitch. <laughs> brief, please, I beg of you. All right, all right. What do you want me to do? What can I do? <sighs> can you please let Cynthia play this no! one? No! One... Listen, I owe Elizabeth. I got her pregnant today. What? I got her pregnant today. I owe her this. How did you... How, How do you... How is this possible so fast? How does she know she's pregnant? She no, the, the bellies go real fast when it's me. <laughs> the bellies go real fast. <laughs> Hello? Is is someone in this closet where I normally keep my fur stoles? Yeah, who's this? Oh, is that Elizabeth? This is Cynthia, your nemesis. Oh, fancy meeting you here in a closet. What do you do? Oh, your belly. You can... <laughs> It is a very unusual theater in that the uh, closets uh, have doors on either side uh-huh. of the dressing room. Okay. So uh, uh, is that going to be a problem? No, no. I like a labyrinthian rental. All right. Well, thank you for investing all of this money in uh, a English language production of <laughs> Romeo and Juliet here in Paris. You're welcome. Elizabeth. Yes? I warned you that this would happen. You didn't heed my advice. Get closer. I can't hear you with our bellies touching. We're so far apart. I can't help but feel sorry for you. Why? Because you wanted this. I know. Now you have it. So badly. But I can't help but feel, if I'm following in your footsteps, 
I feel honored in some way. <laughs> it smells of cedar and tears in here. Oh. Hey, is someone in there? No. No. Hey, Elizabeth, who? Hey, is someone in there? <laughs> hey, who's on the other? Quick. Is someone at the other door? Hide in the closet of the closet. Okay, <laughs> and quick, cover yourself in all these furs so everyone will... Okay. Yeah. Uh, also, I should tell you, uh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. all the closets they have uh, little yeah. closets inside. Okay, how many? Is it like a Russian nesting closet? Pretty much. I mean, you might end up in Narnia for all I know. It's crazy <laughs> in there. This is great. I love the theater. Let's do it. Okay, cover yourself in fur stoles. That way they'll never think that it's you because you're such a pauper. <laughs> okay, get in the closet, you bitch. Okay. Okay. Hello? Hey, Elizabeth. Who are you talking to in here? Oh, I was doing my vocal exercises. Kunaga, kunaga. Oh. Wait a minute. There's someone under that, that mink stole. Oh, uh, I am nothing. What? You are wind and water and rain. I'm just a, a, a chorus girl from Assassins Next Door. That's me. I'm in the chorus of a show that's mostly just duets and single songs. You have a beautiful voice. Have you ever thought of maybe playing the role of Juliet? Oh, I couldn't possibly. What? Well, you're pregnant now, aren't you? And this mink stole seems to have a very beautiful voice. She just plays one of Mark Wayne Gacy's or D- <laughs> John David Chapman's little little floozies. I forget who it is. Please, I've been Angel, in Paris too Angel long. of Music, take off your stole. Let me see your face. Oh, uh, have you ever seen The Phantom of the Opera? You know it's not great when I take it off, but here I must go. <gasps> Cynthia! That's right. <laughs> Joke's on you, Briff. Yeah, Briff. What are you talking about, Elizabeth? <laughs> I don't, not sure. <laughs> Francois, come quick! Uh, 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 I got lost in one of the closets. <laughs> Francois, I'll tell you what's happened. <laughs> thank you, thank you for you not, looked- thank you for not making me ask you. Would bring shame on me as a director. <laughs> you looked like you wanted to know, and I, I, I dismissed I did. questions. I did. So here are the answers. Briff just nominated me back into the role of Juliet. Ha, ha! I say. I didn't know it was her. I thought it was a mixed star with a cool voice. Well, it still is. So many mink stalls in these closets. Now, here's what I'm thinking of for costumes, okay? Okay, yes. Everyone is in fur. Oh, uh, Zutalu, yes. <laughs> and we said it, it's Romeo and Juliet, but it's set in Alaska. Oh, hello. <laughs> Oui, oui. Yes, this sounds uh, beautiful. Uh, I will get uh, several polar bear uh, coats. We will wear them, and uh, Peter will uh, breathe down our necks. Money is no expense. Never is. It's uh, France. Absolutely. And remember, I know what I'm talking about, because when I worked for Yves Saint Laurent, I bought all the samples. And when I worked for Givenchy, I as well. Then they said some mean things that time, right? About the case. <laughs> What's going on in here? I didn't invest a bunch of money in this production to see a bunch of people standing around when there's crowds waiting in the stalls. Oh, mon dieu, it is our producer. Uh, hello, hello, sir. Hello, hello sir. Hello, hello. Francois. Charmed, Cynthia. I'm sure. Oh, mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, who is this? Hi. This is Elizabeth. She is our understudy. She was maybe going to go on tonight as Juliet. What do you mean, maybe? I don't know about this. Wouldn't you rather see the woman who originated the role play it? Hmm. Well, I think there's only one way to decide. A survivor-like physical challenge. We are both extremely pregnant. <laughs> All the better. This seems very dangerous to me. Are you sure you want to do I, this? I can be talked out of it. <laughs> All right, well, let the physical trials begin. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this evening's performance of Romeo and Juliet. A programming note, the role of Juliet, normally played by Cynthia Roman, will tonight be played by Mr. Victor Garber. (laughs) And it all happened in a place called Paris. Priya Blasucci? Yeah. <laughs> Where can people find you online? Should they wish to find you and should you wish to be found? I, you can find me M underscore Blasucci. M underscore Blasucci. That's one S, two C's. 
Don't, don't look at it. I know how to spell it. <laughs> Uh, and that's on uh, Twitter and, and Instagram. And sometimes I post some stuff, but, who, you know, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> who cares? Indeed. <laughs> July 11th. What do you want to tell people about? Um, I think the the new Christopher Guest uh, Netflix movie that I'm in is going to be coming out soon. Fantastic. What is the name of that film? Mascots. There uh, we go. So take a... Keep an eye on the on the prize. Look for the Blasuch and Mascots. <laughs> Gorals. Matt Corley on Instagram and Twitter. Mm-hmm. What other? You got a lot of things to tell people about. Plen- podcasts and stuff. Plenty of podcasts. Uh, I'll be on the Harmon Quest show on CISO. There we go. Uh, I did an episode of that as well. As well. Right? That's yeah. right. Yeah, that, yeah, 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 that was fun. Uh, look for that. That should be out by then. I think so, right? I think so. I don't know what's going on. I don't either. Tony. Yes. What do you want to tell people about? Um, you can find me on my website, tawnynewsome.com. Please follow me on Twitter, Trondy Newman. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think by then, uh, Cameron Esposito and Rio Butcher show will be out. Take my wife. Take my wife on CISO. I'm on an episode of that. Take my wife, starring Cameron Esposito and Rio Butcher, premieres Thursday, August 11th on CISO. A lot of uh, also speaking of CISO, we are both CISO. on bajillion, bajillion dollar, dollar properties, properties, which will be over by then. But gearing up for season two to be released. That's exactly right. Pistol Fine. Shrimps documentary is going to be on CISO too. There we go. Oh, that's so, right. That's yeah. right. They bought the rights. Yeah. That's right. Fantastic. Yeah. You know why it's called CISO? No. Stephanie Allen told me this. Tell us. So, say you want to see something with Zach Galifianakis in it. So, see. So. Oh, I wish I'd never heard that. Yeah, I don't want that in my knowledge. <laughs> I don't understand. tell Stephanie to stop they telling said people that. She said, they said that in a meeting to her. They said, no, they "Don't you want to see that person?" So, oh no, they I- shouldn't be telling people that. <laughs> oh dear, oh, no, no, oh, Evan, is- Dan, please don't tell we, anyone. We never make edits, but we're going to cut this part out. <laughs> we're going to. I- <laughs> See? I, for one, like it. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Eben Schletter at Eben Schletter on all the things. Go to ebenschletter.com and check out Eben's other work that is not Spontaneous Nation because it is great. And why is it great? Because Eben Schletter is only the best for me. Go watch Bajillion Dollar Properties. Come on, it's funny. <laughs> CISO is actually worth your money because they got good stuff on there. Forget that story about the game. You don't need to remember <laughs> you that. You never heard that. You never heard that. Don't tell anyone you heard it here. See? Um, ugh, so- stop it. Stop it. <laughs> um, PaulFTompkins.com slash live. You can find all my live dates. Um, the, 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 the live shows that we do, Spontaneous Nation Live, happens at Largo at the Coronet the first Saturday of every month. And the next one in August will feature... Uh, not only Dan Adut and Tim Baltz from Bajillion Dollar Properties, it will also feature Tawny Newsom from Bajillion Dollar Properties. And our guest is from You're the Worst, uh, the very funny Desmond Borges. Really? Yes, we the went friend. to college together. Did you really? He's a dear friend. He is a wonderful, no idea. fantastically funny person. And ah. that is going to be a fun night. So please do come out to that. Tickets are on sale. PaulFTompkins.com slash live. Thank you to Earwolf for hosting our show. Thank you to Engineer Ryan for engineering us all the way to the end of the show, which this is. Goodbye forever. Until next week, this is Paul F. Tompkins saying, Semper in presenti. Thanks again to Loot Crate, the monthly subscription box for geeks, gamers, and pop culture nerds. Join us as we celebrate the futuristic. We've packed July's crate with items from some of pop culture's favorite prognostications of science and the future. Look towards tomorrow with items from Rick and Morty, Futurama, Mega Man, Valiant Comics, and Star Trek, including a model, a figure, and don't forget our monthly tea and pin. You only have until the 19th at 9 p.m. Pacific to subscribe and receive that month's crate. And when the cutoff happens, that's it. It's over. So go to lootcrate.com slash PFT and enter code PFT to save $3 on your new subscription today. Hello, hello. This is Nagin Farsad, the host of Fake the Nation, where we talk about politics, we talk about news, and we have a laugh. We were laughing. Every week, a cast of my funniest, smartest, and most politically astute friends, people like John Fugelsang, Liz Winstead, Dean Obidala, and others, tackle all the major issues like climate change. America leads the world in people who think climate change is fake, but pro wrestling is real. <laughs> Guns! I started calling the NRA the AK-47%. <laughs> <laughs> Filibuster? I don't even know her! Okay, that's not a major issue, but it's a really great pun. Guys, Fake the Nation is all the comedy about politics without any of the politics about politics. <laughs> Fake the Nation! Here 
This has been an Earwolf production. Executive producers Scott Ackerman, Adam Sachs, Chris Bannon, and Paul F. Tompkins. For more media and content, go to earwolf.com.